today we have countries such as ones of the Eurozone where people enjoy full political rights, so everyone has a right to vote, but that is completely pointless because whichever government the people vote for, that government will find itself essentially deprived of all the basic tools of policy making. Monetary unions between different heterogeneous economies don't promote convergence, they promote divergence. People, I would say, in a way have a much better understanding of the workings of the system than lofty intellectuals who are pretty clueless. What I have said is that this campaign is not just about electing a president, it is about making a political revolution. Taking money from our children and borrowing from China. People are dying. Is the program so critical it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And if not, I'll get rid of it. Stop lying! Now, let's see if we can avoid the apocalypse altogether. Here's another episode of Macro and Cheese with your host, Steve Grumbine. Yes, this is Steve Grumbine with Macro and Cheese. This week, we have a phenomenal guest. I'm very excited to bring on Thomas Fozzi. Thomas is a writer and journalist. Uh, he was also the co-author of Reclaiming the State, a Progressive Vision of Sovereignty for a Post-Neoliberal World. He co-authored that with our friend Bill Mitchell. He is also a former documentary filmmaker and an award-winning one at that, which he co-directed Standing Army in 2010. With that, I want to bring on my guest, Tom Fozzi. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So this has been quite a journey here. I've been reading your work and most poignantly, the book you co-authored with Bill Mitchell, Reclaiming the State. This is just an incredible book. It's almost like a, dare I use the word Bible, for progressives <laughs> who really want to understand how to reclaim the state. It really breaks down neoliberalism and how it all came to be. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? Right. So, so I've known Bill for quite some time now, and so a few years back, he invited me over to Australia, and he said, why don't you come over and we can do some work together. We weren't talking or thinking about writing a book at the time, just doing some research and you know, writing up some stuff, on, mostly on the Euro crisis, which both of us had written a lot about over the years, and so I'd been wanting to do an experience abroad for some time. So I said, yeah. So I went down to Newcastle, where Bill lives in Australia. In New South Wales. And basically, over many coffee sessions, of course, you know, we got talking about a bunch of stuff. And a topic we currently kept returning to was the sorry state of the left, especially in Europe, but not just in Europe, and the reasons for historical defeat of the socialist left in Europe and its almost sort of disappearance from the scene not just the sort of third way social democratic left which you know won't be missed if it well, once it uh, <laughs> disappears <laughs> once and for all but also sort of traditional labor and socialist left which has also been hammered in you know elections year after year especially in the past 10 years especially since the crisis and so we got talking about that and just yeah one coffee at a time we started sketching out this book and yeah, and one issue we kept returning to was sovereignty, national sovereignty. The importance that historically that the notion of national sovereignty had had for the socialist left in sort of the post-war years, sort of 30 years following the Second World War, where the left had really put the defense uh, of national sovereignty at the, at the forefront of its politics, and how this beginning in the 70s had radically changed and how essentially over time the left had essentially switched over to globalism, to anti-sovereignism and had essentially relinquished, all but relinquished the battle for sovereignty, the defense of sovereignty. He had completely forgotten 
what it had known, and that is that national sovereignty remains the most important locus for democratic, or, or our city only locus for democratic organizing and democratic action, and essentially allowed the globalists to take over, in fact, became globalist itself. And over the years, actively, not passively, but actively supported the transfer of national prerogatives, national tools of especially economic policymaking to the supranational and international organizations. The European Union obviously being the most clear example of that and how this had had disastrous consequences in economic and social terms and of course in political terms as well because that meant that one bit of time citizens were taken were deprived of the necessary tools to essentially be able to influence economic policy once you transfer all the essential elements of economic policy outside of the realm of the nation state and you transfer those tools to international or even worse supranational organizations which are outside of the control of citizens, which citizens have little or no means with which to influence. Yes, what we've witnessed has been a slow but steady and over the years increasingly dramatic erosion of democracy. This has happened, I would say, all over the West, including in the US. And this has happened through various mechanisms. So the, the creation of formally independent central banks, sort of formal separation between monetary policy and the treasury and government, even though we know that's never a true independence, but it still proved to be powerful in political terms to disempower democratic policymaking. It also includes, for example, the signing of bilateral and multilateral trade treaties, which increasingly prohibit government intervention in the economy, especially intervention of the progressive kind. The liberalization of capital flows, uh, these are all things that slowly but surely have progressively eroded the ability of citizens to influence economic policy through the ballot box. And of course, this was brought to its most extreme consequences, this logic, in Europe. Ironically, Europe being the kind of cradle of, <laughs> of democracy and of popular sovereignty through the creation of the European Union and especially the Eurozone where what can be considered the essential plank of sovereignty, of economic sovereignty, which is the ability to issue currency, the monopoly over the currency, was relinquished to a supranational central bank, which is, of course, the European Central Bank. And the consequence of that is that today, citizens in the Eurozone especially have practically no means of influencing economic policy through elections. So what we've seen has been the achievement of what has been sort of the long-standing goal of the neoliberal globalists, of the neoliberal globalist project, which was conceived or uh, I would say perfected in the early 20th century and the 20s and 30s, especially by leading neoliberal theorists like Hayek and von Mises and people of this kind. What they... I would say very intelligently understood was that the gradual integration of the masses through mass democracy into the political systems, into the Western political systems, posed a great threat to capital because for the first time, capital saw the possibility of it being wiped out or at the very best, seriously, or at the very least to see its powers seriously curtailed by means of democratic policymaking. So they saw a real threat. I would say correctly, there's a real threat for capitalism, or at least for the kind of free market, extreme neoliberal capitalism that they supported. And of course, they realized that the solution couldn't be to take away uh, the voting rights, which have been hard won by people in the West uh, through centuries of struggles. They couldn't impose dictatorships sort of all over the West, uh, as they did in a lot of uh, developing countries. Well, not them personally, but as the neoliberals have done throughout the 20th century in a number of developing countries, but they realized that wouldn't fly very well in the West. Sort of taking away universal suffrage wasn't a feasible solution. And so what they envisioned was a way of keeping in place formal political rights, voting rights, but at the same time, essentially separating 
the, the mechanisms of the democratic policy making from macroeconomic policy, essentially. And they conceived various ways of doing this. One way that they foresaw was that of creating international, supranational, para constitutional legal arrangements that would severely limit the ability of individual states to decide that sort of the economic policy they wanted to follow because they would be straight jacketed within these international or supranational legal arrangements, while at the same time, of course, you know, allowing people to vote for whoever they wanted to. But of course, that became less and less of a problem once you start to progressively reduce the scope of what individual governments can do. And another way, of course, was to, uh, instrument they foresaw, was to essentially internationalize the state and so transfer national tools of policymaking, as I said, to international and supranational organizations. That was, of course, uh, bound to prove even more effective because it essentially meant that nation states would find themselves lacking basic tools to implement economic policy, especially of the kind of progressive redistributive kind, which they were very hostile to, of course. And so, yes, this has been, a, I would say, a century-long project, which has essentially been very successful, I would say, and has been brought to completion. So today we have countries such as ones in the Eurozone where people enjoy full political rights, that everyone has a right to vote, but that is completely pointless because whichever government the people vote for, that government will find itself essentially deprived of all the basic essential tools of policymaking. So this is a situation in which we are now. It's profoundly I wouldn't even say post-democratic. I mean, it's a-democratic. There's really nothing democratic about the Eurozone. And I would say what has unfolded in Europe over the past 10 years proves that beyond a shadow of doubt. We saw what happened in Greece when the Greeks dared to vote for an anti-austerity government. But we've seen similar forms of financial blackmail being implemented in Italy, both in 2011 and even more recently, including, you know, as I speak, and elsewhere as well. So I think this really reminds us of what Wing Godley warned about in 1992, when even the UK was debating whether to enter the UK, uh, sorry, the Eurozone or not. And I think Wing Godley, in that instance, wrote what I consider to be uh, one of the best articles ever written about the Euros, a very short article that he published in the London Review of Books called about Maastricht and all that, if I'm not mistaken. And he essentially talks about many you know, many reasons why the UK should not join the Eurozone, but he focuses on one essential aspect, and that is, in his own words, that a country that loses or gives up the power to issue one's own currency essentially reduces itself to the status of a colony or region within a nation state. Meaning that, yes, it'll, you know, it can make minor choices with regards to, I don't know, education or, or whatever, uh, or individual rights and so on. But when it comes to economic policy, it'll find itself practically deprived of all the essential tools of policymaking, much like a colony or region. So, you know, I think history has definitely proved them right on that point. And just one final point I would like to add on this is that all this happened. It wasn't a result of what we today call globalization or globalism or, or whatever. It wasn't a result of kind of the inner workings of capitalism. There was nothing inevitable about it. And it certainly wasn't something that was imposed upon national elites. In fact, it was something that was actively pursued by national elites. And, and I think the, the way to understand this is by internationalizing the state and even by disempowering national sovereignty, you're not necessarily making the state itself weaker. In fact, in many respects, the state, the executive branch of the state, becomes even more powerful because it becomes even less accountable to the electorate, to citizens. So, you know, who really lost out were the citizens. What really lost out was democracy. But uh, this was a project that was implemented by the nation states themselves. They realized that by appearing weaker, especially vis-a-vis -vis their own electorate, they could in fact become stronger because they would be able to implement antisocial uh, neoliberal economic policies that would have otherwise been strongly resisted by the citizens if the individual governments had been responsible and accountable for those decisions. 
by saying, look, this is not our choice. This is something we have to do to appease the European Central Bank or the European Commission or the WTO or you name it. So by displacing the responsibility for these policies upon external institutions and factors, they were able to sort of implement and push through the neoliberal transition much more effectively than they would have been able to otherwise. So I think this is an important point. Of course, now in a way, even national elites themselves, I think, are slowly realizing the kind of Faustian pact that they signed by uh, relinquishing sort of what are the essential planks of economic policy, because now even those elites themselves, you know, Italy is a great case in point. We saw what happened to the former government, which was led by the kind of neoliberal center-left Democratic Party, whose members were among the most enthusiastic supporters of European integration back in the 90s. Even they found them, realized that they essentially lacked the basic tools necessary to maintain consensus in a democracy. And so we saw the Democratic Party leaders scramble and beg the European Commission for some so-called uh, fiscal flexibility just so they could implement some mildly, timidly expansionary policies to kind of win back the support of the electorate. Of course, as we now know, that was too little too late. And in fact, they were completely hammered at the last elections. But I think this is what I've called the revenge of depoliticization in a way which is now coming back to a haunt even those national elites that sponsored depoliticization in the first place. So for people that are, you know, not necessarily familiar with all the intricacies of the Eurozone, the EU, the machinations of the Euro, the Troika, and all the other buzzwords that we mm -hmm. hear within the news and so forth, some of the things that jump out are obviously the austerity forced on Greece, which you mentioned, right. and also the Brexit situation with the UK, who did retain their mm -hmm. monetary sovereignty with the pound sterling. I guess my question to you is, can you explain the give and take? Because it appears to the outside that these states, these member states within the European Union, the euro using countries are similar to states, or as you called it, colonies. But the states in the United States who have lacked monetary mm -hmm. sovereignty, who are dependent on the federal government, what is the relationship, if you will, to the importer-exporter nations? You look and you see Germany, who is robust and a huge producer, and they seem to run the whole area with an iron fist. And then you go down to Greece, who is basically a net importer without monetary sovereignty to offset that, and they're in a perpetual you know, lose, lose, it appears like. Can you talk about the structure maybe a little bit and those two key things in Brexit and Greece? Right. That's a lot of stuff there. Um... <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, I think the comparison with the US helps us to understand why the European Union and Eurozone especially is so different from the US and from any other federation in the world, really. We've known since ever, I would say, or for a very long time, that essentially monetary unions between different heterogeneous economies don't promote convergence, they promote divergence. So we've known this for a very long time. This has led to a number of theories, including the so-called optimum currency area theory by Robert Mondo and a number of other theories. And you know what they all agree upon is that monetary unions essentially promote divergence. So they tend to favor the strongest economies with the most developed economies and sort of more export-led economies. And they tend to hinder the weaker economies, the ones that historically have had a higher inflation rate and so on. And the only way to compensate for the divergence created by monetary unions is to have essentially national forms of fiscal transfers to offset the negative consequences of monetary union. And so if you look at the US, for example, you've got individual states that doing a comparison with the Eurozone, 
that are exporting states, and there are also states that are perennially in surplus, meaning that they send more money to the federal government than they receive from the federal government. And then you've got states that experience perennial trade deficit and perennially in deficit vis-a-vis -vis the federal state, meaning that they receive more money from the yeah. national government than they send back. And this compensates for the negative consequences of having a single currency. And this is the same pretty much in all federations, you know, Australia, the UK, and even most nation states, which were created, you know, from the aggregation of previous regions. Italy, for example, what is now Italy was a geographical space where there were, you know, dozens, in fact, hundreds of currencies, which were all eliminated, formed into one single currency once Italy was created. And so, so yeah, so that's really the only way that's how monetary unions work, by having forms of fiscal solidarity or fiscal transfers between states or regions and also between states and regions and the federal government. This, of course, is what has always been lacking in the Eurozone, where nation states have been deprived, their currencies have been deprived of monetary policy. By being deprived of monetary policy, they were also effectively, you know, de facto deprived of also fiscal policy because it's intimately connected. But at the same time, no forms of fiscal transfers at the federal level were created. And so this goes very far in explaining the mess that, that the Eurozone is currently into and why some nations have hugely benefited from the Eurozone, especially the traditionally export-oriented nations such as Germany and more in general, the larger sort of former Deutschmark bloc of Central and Northern Europe. They've benefited from essentially an artificially low exchange rate, which has allowed them to accrue trade surpluses that they never would have been able to accrue with their own currency because they would have seen their own currency appreciate as a result of their trade surpluses, which in turn would have caused a reduction in said surplus. And while at the same time, you've got the countries, especially the countries of the Mediterranean, which traditionally have been much more dependent on internal demand and much less export oriented and which have traditionally been characterized by higher inflation rates than Germany, why they've lost out and why they've been characterized by essentially, you know, relatively high levels of unemployment, gradual deindustrialization, destruction of their industrial base, and so on, with nothing really to compensate for that at the federal level. For a while, private capital compensated for it. So, you know, in a way, the accumulation of this growing divergences between countries were kind of masked on by private capital-led booms in a number of countries. You are listening to Macro and Cheese, a podcast brought to you by Real Progressives, a nonprofit organization dedicated to teaching the masses about MMT or modern monetary theory. Please help our efforts and become a monthly donor at PayPal or Patreon. Like and follow our pages on Facebook and YouTube, and follow us on Periscope, Twitter, and Instagram. So, you know, as far as the news, we've seen so much about Brexit and it's been convoluted because people that are of the exit persuasion have typically been lumped in mm -hmm. as right wing nationalists and the economic underpinnings of the why behind that has been lost in sort of the social engineering right. kind of mindset. But in reality, there is a perfectly valid macroeconomic side to this as well that maybe is a secondary or maybe a primary reason why Brexit makes so much sense. Can you lay out the understanding of what Brexit is and what the actual story behind that is? Right. So I think Brexit should be framed within a wider trend that we are witnessing 
all over the West and especially in Europe, but not only in Europe. And that is a growing demand for what you could call repoliticization. So as a result of this 20, 30 year long strategy of depoliticization of governments, essentially, I was more than governments, I would say national elites and national oligarchies relinquishing, whether for real or just in words, relinquishing powers to international and supranational organizations, essentially to better control their populations, as I said, has led to a deep, serious hollowing out of democracy, of popular sovereignty. And people are realizing that. People have realized, or are increasingly realizing that they've, or maybe they just have a gut feeling that they've lost control over their lives. Basically, they've lost control or they feel they have no control over the economy, over their country's politics, more specifically over the, the various flows that characterize neoliberal capitalism. And that's, you know, flows of capital, flows of trade, and also flows of people, flows of labor. And we can maybe come back to that after. And so what this has created is a growing demand for for what was encapsulated very well in the Brexit slogan, get back control, and that is a demand for greater control. Now that was derided, especially by people on the left, this notion of people wanting to get back control, ha ha, what a ridiculous thing to say. And I think that's, you know, you mentioned the left's attitude towards Brexit, which has mainly been very hostile, very antagonistic to not just the parties that have sponsored Brexit, but the notion of Brexit itself. And I think that has to do with what I mentioned earlier, the globalist turn of the left or the cosmopolitan turn of the left, meaning that over the years, over the decades, most people on the left have come to the conclusion that either nation states have no power, that they really have lost power as a result of sort of the intrinsic workings or the intrinsic dynamics of capitalism, and that it's ridiculous to try to get that back, to turn back the clock, so to say, which is a phrase they like to use very much. And that, you know, national sovereignty is a thing of the past. And the best we can hope for is international or supranational forms of policymaking or decision making, such as the ones represented by the European Union. Now, we know that's not true. I mentioned earlier that states remain very firmly in control of the economy. You know, uh, markets and private capital absolutely need states to intervene on a permanent, regular, heavy basis in the economy. So the notion that we've gone from, you know, the Keynesian era when governments intervened in the economy and regulated the economy and so on to an era where, the, where states have supposedly retreated away from the economy, left the economy to its own workings, left the free market to its own workings, or have been forced to do that by market forces themselves is completely false. So states continue to intervene in the economy just as much as they did in the Keynesian era. The big difference is that they don't intervene to mediate between the interests of labor and capital. They intervene almost exclusively to forward the interests of capital. And we have many examples of that. There's nothing free about the free market system. Indeed, it's not even a free market system at all. We have heavy intervention by the state in defense of capital and support of capital in a variety of ways. So states still play a crucial role. And you know, not understanding this, the left has essentially bought into the mainstream globalist narrative, which is that states really have lost power. <laughs> and so in a way, they've started believing that narrative, and that has caused them to make a number of strategic blunders over the years. And the left's attitude to Brexit and to national sovereignty in general now, in this crucial moment in history, is a telling demonstration of uh, yet another great strategic blunder. Because I think this demand for, for greater control over our lives is a legitimate demand. And so, yes, you mentioned that the UK doesn't have the euro and in fact retains much more economic autonomy than countries that have the euro. But that doesn't mean that 
national elites, even in the UK, haven't resorted to depoliticization to impose policies on their people. And so I think it's only natural that people respond to this feeling of being disempowered and of wanting greater democracy by claiming greater national sovereignty, greater sovereignty. I think people on an instinctive level realize that the nation state is the only level where their voices can be heard. And it turns out they're right. You know, people, I would say, in a way, have a much better understanding of the workings of the system than lofty intellectuals who are pretty clueless. In fact, you know, most people understand the notion, for example, of democratizing the European Union is a joke. You know, people on an instinctive level realize that they're never going to be able to have their voices heard at the level of the European Union in the way that their voices are heard at the national level. And so I think this goes a long way in explaining Brexit and also in explaining the left's opposition to it. And I think just to return to the left once more, to, to make things worse, most people on the left haven't only come to the conclusion that states are powerless when in fact they're not. They've also accepted the idea that there's something intrinsically reactionary about national sovereignty itself, that the concept of national sovereignty is in itself reactionary. And instead, we should, you know, abolish borders and, you know, aim for a greater integration between countries and greater, you know, and ideally, I guess, aim for some kind of world government where we can all live happily ever after. A kind of John Lennon-ish vision of politics. And of course, this to me is just as absurd as the notion that states have lost all their power. It's at the national level that most of the economic and social and political accomplishments that the working class has been able to accomplish over the centuries is, have taken place. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we haven't, uh, our political, economic, social rights were all won within the context of the nation state. So, of course, the nation state and nationalism have, you know, done a lot of damage throughout the 20th century and even before that. But to identify the nation state just with nationalism, just with wars, just with xenophobia or, you know, ethno identitarianism or however you want to call it, I think is missing out on a big part of the story. And that's the part of the story where we also managed to achieve pretty much everything that we have achieved at the nation state level. And so I think I would say that globalism today as an ideology and especially kind of left-wing globalism, is one of the greatest obstacles that we face to change because, in a way, it's the idea that the change can only happen at the global level or, at the very least, at the regional level, if we look at the European Union. Now, that's essentially like saying that change is impossible. <laughs> if change can only happen at the global level or at the regional level, if change can only happen once, and X number of countries agree on, you know, doing a good thing. A, it, it means that, you know, we're never going to achieve that because historically <laughs> that's not how change has happened. And B, it also gives our elites a great excuse not to do anything about the things that need to be addressed, you know, whether it's climate change or whether it's addressing the economic problems that countries are facing and so on. because hey, they've got, you know, the people on the left are saying that, you know, we can't do that at the national level. We can only do that at the global level. So, you know, let's just hope that one day we can get all countries to agree on what to do. Until then, we're just going to keep doing what we've done until now. So, in fact, it's a very reactionary ideology. And that's not surprising, considering, as I said, globalism is historically the ideology of the capitalists, of the elites that have always aimed at creating a government above governments that would prove impervious to democratic change. So I think that's kind of where we're at with the left more in general. And one final point uh, with regards to Brexit is I think that a lot of people look at what has happened over the past three years since the referendum, you know, all the confusion, all the political scandals, and essentially, you know, the mess that Brexit has become. And they come to the conclusion, oh, you see, that's proof that there is no alternative. That's proof that a country cannot leave the European Union. Look at the UK. 
They're trying to leave. They want to leave, but they're unable to because our economies are too connected and too intertwined for one country to hope to reclaim some degree or a greater degree of economic sovereignty and autonomy. When in fact, the only reason that Brexit has been such a mess is that the British government, the Tories, which sponsored Brexit referendum in the first place, sure that the referendum would lose, sure that, you know, Remain would win, sort of as a bone to throw to popular demands, shocked by the Brexit victory for the past three years, have essentially been trying to fudge Brexit. So all the complications that we've seen in the UK political scene over the past three years is, to a large degree, the British government trying to fudge Brexit or to achieve what in the UK they call Brino, Brexit in name only. So, you know, everything Theresa May has worked for has been a way for the country to formally leave the European Union while keeping in place all the rules and all the economic arrangements that keep the UK economy to a large degree shackled to EU law. And that just harks back to what I was saying earlier. And the reason is that the EU laws, whether we're talking of anti-state aid laws, which means that laws that prohibit or seriously hinder government support for national industries, or the constitutionalization of free capital flows at the EU level, or the ban on or the prohibition of public monopolies in industries and services and so on. These are all rules and legal arrangements that work just fine for British capitalists. And they also provide a kind of reassurance that if Corbyn should ever win the elections, his scope of maneuver will be severely limited by these rules and arrangements. And so I think this is really the Brexit story up till now, which has been further complicated by the inability of the UK Labour Party to propose an alternative progressive vision of Brexit, thereby also winning back the support of a large part of the British working class that voted for Brexit. Instead, the neoliberal elements of the party have progressively and increasingly pushed Corbyn to essentially, you know, take a fairly strong anti-Brexit stance to the point that now we're also seeing calls from a number of Labour Party quarters for a second referendum with the hope of overhauling the result of the first referendum, which I think would be a tragic choice. And so I think this also goes quite far in explaining the crisis of the Labour Party, which despite the complete F up of the Tories over Brexit seems unable to really challenge them when it comes to hard numbers and to popular support, especially among the working class. So, yeah, so I think this is kind of where the Brexit story is at. So, Thomas, I really want to thank you for the time here. This has been a really, really eye opening interview. I appreciate all the work you've done. Can you just finish off with kind of letting us know how we can follow you and your work? Well, I publish most of my articles on social media. So you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. I do also have a website, thomasfarzi.net. But yeah, I'm not very good at keeping it updated. So I plan on doing that. But uh, So for the time being, social media is the best way to keep up. And well, first of all, I want to thank you guys for this interview. It's been a real pleasure for me too. And I'm also happy to say that me and Bill have started working on a new book, which will kind of be a sequel to Reclaiming the State. And so we'll be posting updates about that in the following weeks and months. And we hope to have that out by next year. Fingers crossed. That is exciting news. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. There's been uh, <laughs> a number of very interesting developments since the book came out two years ago. Yeah, a lot to say. <clears throat> Very good. So I want to thank you once again, and hopefully we can have you back on again real soon. I hope so. It'll be a pleasure. Absolutely. Have a great day, man. Thanks. Yeah, you too, guys. Macro and Cheese is produced by Andy Kennedy. 
descriptive writing by Virginia Cotts, and promotional artwork by Mindy Donham. Macro and Cheese is publicly funded by our Real Progressive Patreon account. If you would like to donate to Macro and Cheese, please visit patreon.com slash realprogressives. I want the truth!